Hello, fellow teachers, and welcome to Teaching with Power. My goal is to help you teach and study the scriptures with more relevancy, impact, and power. And I want to thank you for joining me today and allowing me to be a part of your scripture study or lesson prep. I want you to remember that the power in Teaching with Power comes from the scriptures themselves and the Spirit as you study them with real intent. So let's get after it, and this week we're going to be studying the book of James. Now, who was James? James was actually Jesus' brother, or at least his half-brother. A lot of people don't realize that Mary and Joseph had other children after Jesus was born. They're mentioned in the Gospels. Um, Mark chapter 6, verse 3 is one place that you could see that. But one of the things that makes the book of James so special is that of all the writers in the New Testament, I believe that we can safely assume that James knew Jesus the best. Not only did he get to experience Jesus' ministry, but basically his entire life. He grew up with Jesus in the same household. He got to watch Jesus as a child, a teenager, a young man, and on into his 20s. It's clear that James had a deep understanding of Christ's character, and therefore, he's uniquely qualified to teach us what it means to be like him. And it shouldn't surprise us that a major theme of his book is becoming more like Jesus Christ. A few other interesting details about James. It's believed that James became the first bishop of Jerusalem. And we also know that Jesus made a special appearance to James after his resurrection. And that's found in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 7. So to get us started, James uses a lot of imagery in his writing. Biblical object lessons, so to speak. Things like waves, bridles, ship rudders, fire, and fruit. But I would like to use one of his unique object lessons to introduce his book. If I were standing in front of you, I would hold out a mirror and ask, what do you use a mirror for? And I can imagine hearing some of you say, well, uh, to show me what I look like, to help me get ready in the morning, to look for things that I should fix about my image, like combing my hair into place or straightening my tie, or for girls, fixing your makeup or making sure your mascara isn't running. We look into mirrors because we want to appear a certain way. They show us what we look like, but also help us to fix the flaws. Without the mirror, we may be clueless as to what we need to do to improve our appearance. James used a mirror to teach us something about the gospel, and his word for mirror is glass in verse 23, like a looking glass. But I have a question for you. Can you find the phrase somewhere in James 1, 22-25, that tells us what James is comparing a mirror to. Pause the video and see if you can find it. Did you find it? It's in verse 25. The answer is the perfect law of liberty, which has to be one of the best synonyms for the gospel that I know of anywhere. Joseph Fielding Smith tells us that the gospel of Jesus Christ is the perfect law of liberty. It will lead man to the highest state of glory and exalt him in the presence of our Heavenly Father if he is willing to listen to the counsels of those whom the Lord has appointed to guide them. I suggest we stop calling it the gospel and start calling it the perfect law of liberty. Instead of saying, go out and live the gospel, we would say, go out and live the perfect law of liberty. Missionaries would teach from the Preach My Perfect Law of Liberty manual, and we'd all go to perfect law of liberty doctrine class during the second hour of church. And what that phrase suggests to me are the two things that following God's law will lead me to. Perfection, and liberty, or freedom. Satan, he, he's all about bondage and addiction and a loss of agency, while God's law is all about freedom and joy and an increased power to act. So what's the object lesson? James is going to tell us about two different kinds of people that look into that mirror. And here are two things that I want you to consider about these particular verses. One, what does he call the two different kinds of people that look into the mirror? And two, what point do you feel James is trying to make with this object lesson? And here we go. But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself, and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work. This man shall be blessed in his deed. So what are the two different kinds of people? Hearers and doers. And what's the point James is trying to make? 
Well, here's how I see it. One that is merely a hearer is like somebody who looks into the gospel, the perfect law of liberty, or comes in contact with God's word and sees who they are meant to be. But then they walk away and completely forget what they should reflect. They saw the changes that they needed to make, but they never make any. They forget the image. Every week you attend church, you are looking into the mirror. Every time you study your scriptures, you're looking into the mirror. Every time you listen to general conference, you're looking into that mirror. When you walk away from that mirror, do you remember the image that you saw? Or do you quickly forget the type of person that you are meant to be? On the other hand, the doer looks into that mirror and sees who they are meant to be. But instead of forgetting, they continue therein. They walk away striving to become that image, to conform their thoughts and their words and their deeds to that image. And what is the outcome for that person? They're blessed in their deeds. Now, I want you to think about something. When you look into a mirror, you'll see a face, your face. And when you look into the mirror of the perfect law of liberty, you also see a face. But it's not necessarily your face in the mirror. It would be the face of a person who truly lived that law. If you had to choose a face that represents the perfect law of liberty, somebody who truly lived up to its perfect reflection, whose face would you see? It would be Jesus, wouldn't it? And for me, that is the hook of the lesson. How can I reflect Christ better? How can I receive his image in my countenance? Like Alma says in Alma 5.14. And you're going to be taught this from a man who knew him better than almost anybody else at that time. A man who watched him daily throughout his life. James is going to teach you how to reflect Christ. Now you just go through and read the whole book of James with that in mind, and what you will find is a blueprint for reflecting the Savior. There are a lot of various counsels in James, but there are a few ideas that he seemed to gravitate more particularly towards. And interestingly enough, they all start with the letter W. I call them the W's of James. Works, words, wealth, wisdom, and the world. You're going to see these ideas come up again and again in his writing. But before continuing, a quick note about James's style. Now you all know how much I love Paul, and we've been studying his words for what, the last four or five months? I hate to say it, but it's kind of refreshing to hear the gospel preached from a different approach, uh, a different personality. And James couldn't be more different. Where Paul is very diplomatic, careful, tactful, and logical, James is very direct, commanding. Um, his writing is full of imperatives, and he's very straightforward. I call James the Nike Apostle. You know what I mean by that? Just do it. He wants us to just do it. He is all about action. He's more about walking the walk than just talking the talk. He's not interested in theory or opinion or suggestions. He wants us to do something. Now, this may be a bit of an exaggeration, but where Paul is more of a gentle tug, James is a punch in the stomach. Uh, a loving punch in the stomach, but a punch nonetheless. And I'm not saying that one way is better than the other. They're just different. And some people may respond better to the Paul approach and others to the James approach. But more than anything, James wants us to be doers of the word. His older brother was a doer. He saw him live the gospel. Jesus walked the walk. And James expects us to do the same. If you want to get a taste of that message, he probably says it most plainly in James chapter 2, verses 14 through 18. What doth it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith and have not works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding you give them not those things which are needful to the body, what doth it profit? Now that's, now that's kind of a comical example, isn't it? Can you imagine walking up to a homeless person on the street that was cold and hungry and saying, Here, let me help you. All you need are some blankets and some food, and then everything is going to be okay. All right, have a nice day. And then you walk away without doing anything. That's like faith without works. It's silly. Even so, faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Shew me thy faith without thy works, and I will shew thee my faith by my works. So in that spirit, actually doing something because of the word, here's how I suggest we approach his book. 
I'm going to give you a list of possible situations you may or may not find yourself in. You pick one or two that apply most to you. And then I'm going to give you a scriptural prescription. And you go in and read James's counsel for you. And I want you to read his words slowly and carefully and more than once. Make sure that you ponder what he's saying and let it sink deep. And then I invite you to make an action plan of change based on what you've learned. Be a doer, not just a hearer. So here they are. And I suggest that you pause the video here, read over the situations, and pick the ones that are most applicable to you. And if you don't mind, I'm going to try and channel James's personality a little bit here. And I'm going to go through each question with you and very briefly describe what I feel James wants you to do to reflect Jesus Christ. And I'm going to do it in a bit more of a direct tone. And since James didn't feel the need to be really diplomatic, then neither will I. So the first situation here, are you suffering under many afflictions? Go to James 1, 2 through 4. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. Now, the JST is going to make a very critical change there. It's not that we should be happy when we're tempted, but he changes it to many afflictions. So it should read, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into many afflictions. Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. So, you're facing a lot of trials in your life? Accept them. In fact, I'll take it a step further. Find joy in your trials, realizing that trials produce patience. And patience will eventually make you perfect and whole. Now, I don't want to minimize anybody's trials, but I believe it's unrealistic to expect a trial-free life. This life is not for happily ever after. That phrase is reserved for the next life. One who reflects Christ recognizes the value of affliction. And some people say, I'm waiting for God to help me. James is saying, God is waiting for you to start moving so that he can help you. A great example of this is Joseph Smith. Now, there is a man who went through a lot of trials. He was in prison all the time, falsely accused. He had some of his children die. He was constantly mocked, persecuted, tarred and feathered. This is a man who understood suffering. And what did he say about it? I am like a huge rough stone rolling down from a high mountain. And the only polishing I get is when some corner gets rubbed off by coming in contact with something else, striking with accelerated force against religious bigotry, backed by mobs, blasphemers, licentious and corrupt men and women. All hell knocking off a corner here and a corner there. Thus I will become a smooth and polished shaft in the quiver of the Almighty. So I suggest that you, just like Brother Joseph, allow your trials to polish and perfect you. Do you lack wisdom in some area of your life or testimony? Well, read James 1, 5 through 6. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that giveth to all men liberally or freely, and upbraideth not, and he won't chastise you, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. Now you could have a wonderful lesson about how this verse set in motion the restoration of the church, and that would be a very wonderful and fitting thing. However, since we're focused on how the book of James can change you, what does that verse mean for you? Do you lack wisdom? Is your testimony faltering? Is there something you don't understand or you have doubts about over some aspect of the church or the gospel? Is there some guidance that you're seeking? Well, do something about it. Ask God. Kneel down in prayer and ask Him for help. But just make sure that you ask in faith, nothing wavering. And I think that you can read that in two ways. It could be, have faith that you will receive an answer. But asking with faith, nothing wavering, could also mean that you are asking with the intention to act on the answer when it's received. Joseph Smith is such a good example of this. After reading James 1.5, he said, Never did any passage of Scripture come with more power to the heart of man than this did at this time to mine. It seemed to enter with great force into every feeling of my heart. I reflected on it again and again, knowing that if any person needed wisdom from God, I did. For how to act, I did not know. 
Joseph was ready and willing to act on an answer. I think that's a major reason he got an answer. And once he did receive his answer, he certainly acted on it, didn't he? Moroni said to pray with real intent, intent to act on the answer. So pray. Don't just sit around to lamenting the fact that you don't have a testimony or understanding if you don't have the will to take the effort to seek for it. Are you excessively concerned about money? James 1, 10 through 11. But the rich, in that he is made low, because as the flower of the grass he shall pass away. For the sun is no sooner risen with the burning heat, but it withereth the grass, and the flower thereof falleth, and the grace of the fashion of it perisheth. So also shall the rich man fade away in his ways. Now you could also include chapter 5, verses 1 through 6, but I'm not going to include those here. They're a little harsh. He kind of goes off on the rich, and maybe that's because it was a particular problem in the congregations that he was teaching. But don't worry, there are enough other verses in the scriptures that teach us that it is possible to be rich and righteous. It's just really hard. So if your heart is set on riches, what do you need to do? You need to recognize the true value of wealth. It's fleeting. Like the sun withers away the grass, your riches can be here today and gone tomorrow. They will not last forever. And even if you don't lose them in this life, you can't take them with you. Your wealth will perish along with you. Your bank account, the size of your house, your bottom line will mean absolutely nothing in the next life. The person that reflects Christ understands that wealth is just not that important. Think about Jesus. Was he worried about wealth? No, he spent his life walking the dusty roads of Judea, teaching and relying on his father to provide the necessities of life. Are you currently wrestling with a particularly difficult temptation? James 1.12 and 4.7 Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. And then, submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. So what do you need to do? Endure temptation. Just say no. I know the JST changes it to resist temptation, but I also like the word endure. We need to learn to resist and endure temptation. We're going to have to resist it time and time again and endure the temptation to the end. Saying no once is not going to be enough. Don't let your guard down. The best way to get rid of temptation is not to give into it, but to resist it. And what does the Lord promise those that resist? The crown of life. And that could be eternal life, or it could also mean a good life here. And also, the devil will flee from you. There are certain temptations in my life that the devil has just given up on with me. For example, Satan doesn't try to tempt me with breaking the word of wisdom. It's just not hard for me. I don't feel pulled in that direction in any way, shape, or form. I think Satan has recognized that that just isn't going to work on me. Now, he's got plenty of other areas to work with but he's not stupid. He's not going to waste his time on something that he has no possibility of success in. Now, if I could just have that same resolve and attitude in all areas of my life, maybe he'd leave me alone completely. So I say, tell Satan to get lost. You've got better things to do with your time. Do you have trouble controlling your tongue? James 1.19 and 3.2-8. And as I said earlier, this is a major theme of the book of James the way that we use our words. And he says, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. Unfortunately, most of us do just the opposite, right? We're swift to speak and slow to hear. Have you ever heard the saying, God gave you two ears but only one mouth? That's because you ought to listen twice as much as you speak. The art of being a good listener is essential in reflecting Christ. As I read the Gospels, I get the sense that Jesus did a lot of listening and observing. Many of his teachings were short, concise, and to the point. Think about the story of the woman taken in adultery. He hardly says anything in that story. Three to four short sentences is all. And yet, through it, he teaches one of the most impactful messages of his ministry. He was always asking questions, and then listening carefully and intently to the answers that people gave him. Like Stephen R. Covey has suggested, seek first to understand, then to be understood. Case in point, 
Your ears will always get you into less trouble than your tongue. And perhaps it really is preferable to let the cat get your tongue. And then go to chapter 3, verses 2 through 8. For in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man, and able also to bridle the whole body. Behold, we put bits in the horse's mouths, that they may obey us, and we turn about their whole body. Behold, also the ships, which though they be so great, and are driven of fierce winds, yet they are turned about with a very small helm, or rudder, whithersoever the governor listeth. Even so the tongue is a little member, and boasteth great things. Behold, how great a matter a little fire kindleth. And the word matter in that sense means a forest. So, behold how great a forest a little fire kindleth. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members, that it defileth the whole body, and setteth on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire of hell. For every kind of beasts, and of birds, and of serpents, and of things in the sea, is tamed, and hath been tamed of mankind. But the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. It's pretty clear that James felt the tongue had a lot of power for evil and destruction. Look at all the things that he compares it to. Fire, wild beasts, poison. I mean, look what Hitler's tongue was able to do, or Stalin, or Mao. These tyrants had a great ability to speak, and to speak well and powerfully. And with that ability, they caused incredible pain and destruction in our world. Perhaps you've seen the destructive power of the tongue in your own life. I had a sister who really struggled in junior high school. Why? Because of the tongues of others. I remember seeing her come home from school sometimes, and you could just tell that she had endured a day of poisonous, fiery tongues. I still remember a time when my tongue unleashed damage. When I was younger, I was playing a video game and had made it quite far into the game, farther than I'd ever made it before. And my little brother came in and was throwing a ball around near the console. I told him to stop because I just knew that that ball would hit the console and pop out the game and ruin my progress. Well, he didn't stop, and sure enough, the ball ended up hitting the game and resetting it. Oh, I was so angry, and I tell you, I unleashed a barrage of the rudest, meanest things that I could think of to my little brother. By the time I was done, he ran to his room with tears in his eyes. Well, it only took me five minutes to calm down and realize what I'd done, and I felt terrible. I went to his room and I apologized and gave him a hug. But I tell you what, to this day, I still feel guilty for what I said. I wish I could take it back. Our tongues are powerful. So what do we need to do with them? Control your tongue. Bridle your tongue. Use it like a rudder to steer your whole body in the right direction. If you can learn to control your tongue, it'll be far easier to control your actions. Next question. Do you find yourself often wrapped up in the fashions, the entertainment, and the concerns of the world? James 1, 21 and 27, and then 4, 4. James 1.21 has one of my favorite phrases for wickedness in it. See if you can catch it. Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, and receive with meekness the engrafted word, which is able to save your souls. So, are you too wrapped up in the world? What can you do about it? Lay it aside. Get rid of the superfluity of naughtiness, or the overabundance of malice or evil, as the footnote suggests and turn to the Word. Stop opening the worldly magazines and start opening your scriptures. Stop watching crummy movies and start watching General Conference. Stop listening to the celebrities and social media personalities and start listening to the Spirit. Lay aside the naughtiness and pick up the goodness with meekness. A member of the church should be different from the world, like it says in verse 27. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction, and to keep himself unspotted from the world. To be a religious person is to be different from the rest of the world. And then you have 4.4. 4. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever, therefore, will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. So you can't have it both ways. Stop trying to serve two masters. Don't live one way on Sunday and then another way 
the rest of the week? Do you treat people differently based on their income, appearance, or social status? James 2, 1 through 9. I know this is a little bit longer, but here we go. My brethren, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect of persons? For if there come into your assembly a man with a gold ring, in goodly apparel, and there come in also a poor man in vile raiment, and ye have respect to him that weareth the gay clothing, or splendid clothing, and say unto him, Sit thou here in a good place, and say to the poor, Stand thou there, and sit here under my footstool. Are ye not then partial in yourselves, and are become judges of evil thoughts? Hearken, my beloved brethren, hath not God chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith, and heirs of the kingdom which he hath promised to them that love him? But ye have despised the poor. Do not rich men oppress you and draw you before the judgment seats? Do not they blaspheme that worthy name by the which ye are called? If ye fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, ye do well. But if ye have respect to persons, ye commit sin and are convinced of the law as transgressors. What should you do to reflect Christ here? Treat everybody the same, no matter their background, no matter their appearance. Do we serve missions in foreign countries saying how much we love the people, but then get upset and unaccepting when similar people move into our neighborhoods and communities here at home? Do we only gravitate towards people that are like us? Jesus didn't do that. Jesus didn't care if you were rich or poor, male or female, bond or free. He accepted anyone who was willing to listen and learn. Let's do the same. Listen to James. Fulfill the royal law. Love your neighbor as yourself. Do you excuse yourself from living certain commandments and standards? James 2.10 For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. Now you have to be really careful with this one. I don't think he means that if you aren't perfect in all areas of the law, then you might as well be guilty of breaking every commandment in the law. If you look at it that way, you're just going to get discouraged and give up. But I don't think that's what he means. I think he means don't let obedience in one part of the law excuse disobedience in another part of the law. Don't say, you know, I watch all kinds of terrible movies and television programs, but hey, I don't break the word of wisdom. Or, yeah, I may not hardly ever go to church, but I do pay my tithing. Or, I'm a pretty decent member of the church most of the time, so what if I go gambling a couple times a year? It's our attitude towards the commandments that matters. Strive to live all of God's commandments. You certainly won't be perfect in all of them. But don't justify sin in one area because of your obedience in another. Do you have trouble with swearing, vulgar and offensive language, or rude and demeaning criticism? James 3, 10 through 12, 4, 11, and 5, 12. Out of the same mouth proceedeth blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not so to be. Doth a fountain send forth at the same place sweet water and bitter? Can the fig tree, my brethren, bear olive berries, either a vine, figs? so can no fountain both yield salt water and fresh. Speak not evil one of another, brethren. He that speaketh evil of his brother and judgeth his brother speaketh evil of the law and judgeth the law. But if thou judge the law, thou art not a doer of the law, but a judge. But above all things, my brethren, swear not, neither by heaven, neither by the earth, neither by any other oath, but let your yea be yea and your nay nay lest ye fall into condemnation. So some more counsel on our words here, the taming of the tongue. And I have a question for you here. Is there consistency in the way that you use your tongue? Does the same tongue that gives a priesthood blessing later make violent threats to his fellow man? Does the same tongue that sings a lullaby to a baby later spread gossip and rumor about a neighbor? Does the same tongue that blesses the sacrament later tell a dirty joke? Does the same tongue that utters a prayer to God later demean and criticize a family member? Does the same tongue that bears testimony of the gospel of Christ later curse and swear at a co-worker? My opinion about these kinds of situations is the same as James. My brethren, these things ought not so to be. A fountain can't produce both sweet and bitter water at the same time. It's not natural. 
neither is using your tongue in a heavenly way and then in an evil way. Like my mom used to say, if you can't say something nice, then don't say anything at all. And our final question here. Is there somebody you care about deeply that is struggling right now? James 5.16 Confess your faults one to another, and pray one for another, that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. So somebody you know or love needs help? Do something. And one of those things that you can do is pray for them. And sometimes that's all we can do for people. In your opinion, is saying something like, I'll pray for you, just an empty gesture? Or can prayer really make a difference? I believe that praying for other people is not an empty gesture. James tells us that the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous person availeth much. That's the miracle of prayer. It is possible that a person on his knees next to his bed can have an actual real-life effect on another person far, far away. Simply put, yes, it can and does make a difference. Our prayers can alter the natural course of human events. And we may not always know when it does, because we just don't know the way things may have happened differently had we not prayed. We only know what does happen, not what could have happened. So keep praying. Thoughts and prayers mean something. Well, there you have it. Now you know the things that you need to do in order to reflect the Savior from the brother of the Savior himself. And here's a quick recap. Do you want to reflect the Savior? Then recognize that your afflictions will perfect and polish you. Pray with faith when you lack wisdom. Realize that wealth just isn't that important. Resist and endure temptation. Listen more than you speak and bridle your tongue. Keep yourself unspotted from the world. Treat all people the same. Don't allow your obedience in one area to excuse disobedience in another. Be consistent in the use of your tongue and pray fervently. Now you know what James wants you to do. So the real question, are you going to do anything about it? Which of the two mirror people are you going to be right now? Are you going to walk away from the perfect law of liberty that we've just been looking at for the last 30 minutes or so and forget what manner of person you are? Are you going to be a mere hearer or are you going to be a doer? And I don't know how appropriate it is to end with a Michael Jackson lyric, but here goes. I'm starting with the man in the mirror. I'm asking him to change his ways. And no message could have been any clearer. If you want to make the world a better place, take a look at yourself and make a change. And I believe that you can make a change. Start with the person in the mirror. Well, thank you for spending this time with me in the scriptures. I hope you enjoyed the book of James as much as I did. If you'd like a printable lesson plan with the ideas here, it's available at this website. And if you're interested in using the PowerPoint slides that were used to make this video, they're available for a small purchase here. Both links are available in the video description below. I hope it was helpful. If it was, please share it with other people who you feel it could help. Thank you for watching. And as always, get out there and teach with power.